Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Paul Salem. I'm president of the Middle East Institute. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, this session today uh, uh, will be looking at uh, issues of reconstruction and civil war, uh, the challenges of approaching that uh, set of issues, uh, particularly in the Middle East. Uh, uh, obviously, a very uh, important and uh, timely panel. Uh, the panel will be reflecting the output or outcome of three fairly large uh, studies uh, that a uh, couple of them are books and one is a very long uh, World Bank report that will be issued soon. Uh, the occasion of this panel was on the occasion of the publication of this book, uh, which is uh, available uh, online, uh, called Fractured Stability, War Economies and Re Reconstruction in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, it's put out by the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. And the ed editor is Ambassador Luigi Narboni, who is here uh, to my right. Uh, it looks at uh, some of the issues and challenges uh, relating to uh, reconstruction and economics in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, the uh, uh, second uh, work is a report uh, very extensive report being prepared by the World Bank, uh, and I'm told will be available hopefully in February, called Building for Peace. Uh, uh, it is a, uh, a project that some of us, uh, I think Steve, myself, and Ross were part of a very large team that the World Bank assembled over the past two years. Uh, and that report will be, uh, will be out in February, but uh, 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 Francesca Recanitini, who is with us here uh, from the World Bank, uh, will be presenting some of the findings of that report. Uh, thirdly is uh, a book that came out of the Middle East Institute, which is uh, available outside on the desk, edited by my colleague Ross Harrison and myself, and with uh, chapters from a number of Middle East Institute uh, experts and scholars. Ambassador Jerry Firestein, Ambassador Robert Ford, Ambassador Jonathan Weiner, Dr. Nanda Sleem, Marvin Weinbaum, uh, Ahmed Majadiyar, and others from MEI, and some other experts on uh, civil war, looking at those dynamics and looking at ways to end civil wars and delve into issues of, uh, of reconstruction. So a very rich set of uh, research uh, and, uh, and production. Uh, on the panel uh, with me today, let me take a minute to introduce them. To my immediate right is uh, Ambassador Luigi Narboni, as I mentioned. He's currently the director of the Middle East Directions Program at the Robert Schumann Center, Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies uh, at the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. Uh, previously, he served as ambassador and head of the EU delegation to Saudi Arabia uh, at a critical time and was also non-resident ambassador to Qatar, Oman, Bahrain, UAE, and Kuwait. He's also held high positions in the European External Action Service and has served in EC delegations in the Russian Federation as well, uh, in addition to Chile and Turkey, the United Nations, the UNDP. So Luigi, great to have you in from Italy, and thanks for being with us. Uh, Professor Stephen Heidemann, um, a friend and colleague of long standing, was once an intern at MEI many, many years ago. <laughs> there is hope. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, he is currently at uh, Smith College, uh, the Janet Wright Ketchum Chair in Middle East Studies. Uh, he's also in the government department at Smith. He's a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings. Um, uh, he's held a number of senior leadership positions at the US Institute of Peace here in DC, as well as in Georgetown University, Columbia University, and the Social Science Research Council. Uh, as many of you know, has written extensively on governance, uh, authoritarianism, and reconstruction in the Middle East. Uh, Francesca Recanatini to my left, uh, is a lead public sector specialist at the World Bank. Uh, she began work working on institution building in transition countries while at the IMF in 1994 and at the Center for Institutional Reform and Informal Sector. She joined the bank in 98 and has been focusing on measuring quality of institutions and subsequently worked on several countries in Eastern Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. Uh, she's been a key driver in this project that I mentioned called Building uh, for Peace, Inclusive Reconstruction in the Middle East and North Africa. 
Uh, to her left is my colleague, uh, Ross Harrison. Uh, he's an MEI senior fellow, uh, as well as on the, a faculty member at the School of Farm Service at Georgetown University. He's also on the faculty of the University of Pitt Pittsburgh. He's written extensively on, uh, on strategy uh, and things related to strategic planning and strategic thinking. Uh, he and I have also co-edited two books. One is this book on civil wars called Escaping the Conflict Trap, and another book that came out two years ago called From Chaos to Cooperation, about uh, uh, regional order and disorder uh, in the Middle East. Uh, I'll be leading the conversation uh, this afternoon, but uh, uh, we will be integrating your questions live uh, through technology uh, on your phones. If you would get onto the website menti.com, that's www.menti.com. Uh, and do where is uh, do they have to put in a code? Uh, well, I can't see it. So what is it? Seventy-seven sixty-eight eighty-nine. It should be on your flyers. It's on the flyers. There's a code which is seventy-seven sixty-eight sixty-eight six uh, eighty-nine seventy-seven sixty-eight eighty-nine. So when you go on to menti.com, you put in that code. You're in this conversation, uh, and you can post questions either anonymously. Uh, or post a question with your name on it. You can post it uh, and direct it to one of the panelists or have a general questions. All of your questions will show up, God willing, on my iPad. Uh, and instead of waiting for the Q&A period, as the questions come in, I will hopefully integrate them into the conversation. So uh, I encourage you to do that. Uh, we do encourage tweeting if you wish to do that. Uh, please, uh, if so, use hashtag MEI civil wars, so that it's part of one conversations. Uh, do mute your telephone. This is being recorded for uh, a video and to be put on our website as a video. It's not currently being uh, live streamed. We're still having some technical issues in our uh, new building. Uh, for those of you interested in uh, continuing a focus on civil wars, we will have another event on February 6th. There will be announcement coming uh, out on that soon, which will uh, have all, many of the authors of our book on uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Yemen. Uh, and that will be on February 6th, so stay tuned. Uh, let's get started. And Steve, let me start with you. Sure. Um, what would you say is the transition from a conflict economy to a post-conflict economy? Uh, has it been shown that countries really get out of uh, the conflict economy itself, or does it simply become part uh, of the post-conflict economy? And how have you grappled with that sure. uh, in the chapter in this book that you, yeah. that you offer? Thank you, Paul. Uh, Thanks, thank Steve. you to the Middle East Institute for the chance to participate in this panel. Thank you to Luigi for the chance to participate in the larger project. Uh, let me begin responding to the question by making just a couple of, of observations about this transition from, from war to peace first, uh, and it won't be news to anyone here. The challenges of post-conflict reconstruction in the Middle East are among the most daunting that we face, both regional actors but also the international community. The scale of the destruction that has been experienced across the region in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Libya, is truly mind-boggling. We have seen massive historic urban centers reduced to rubble. And so there is a, a challenge on a scale that I think will prove extraordinarily demanding for the international community to respond to. Second observation is that our track record in responding to those kinds of challenges is very, very mixed. There are some cases of success in supporting processes of post-conflict economic reconstruction. I think physical reconstruction may be in some ways an easier of these difficult challenges to wrestle with. But in many respects, we have not done as well as the very well-intentioned institutions and agencies that engage in post-conflict reconstruction might have liked. And one of the big questions is why? What is it that gets in the way of effective post-conflict reconstruction processes, especially the process of rebuilding economies in conflict-affected and post-conflict cases? 
And what I'd like to suggest is that I think one of the big problems is that some of the critical assumptions that guide how post-conflict interventions and strategies are designed don't reflect conflict dynamics in the MENA region very well. And what I want to do quickly is identify three core assumptions that I think are especially influential in how post-conflict reconstruction processes unfold or are intended to unfold, and then point to some shortcomings uh, in those assumptions that I think help us understand why we haven't been more effective. The first of those assumptions is that one of the effects of war is to destroy pre-war economies, is to provide space in which a distinctive kind of economy is constructed. We call it a wartime economic order, emphasizing its different, differentness from what came before. So that the economic norms and practices we see in war contexts differ from those pre before the war. Pre-war economic institutions get destroyed and something new emerges uh, in their place. Second assumption is that because pre-war institutions uh, have been destroyed, because wartime economic orders that operate according to different principles have become consolidated during conflict, the task of post-conflict reconstruction is to rebuild states. Not to rebuild state institutions along the lines that existed before conflict. The whole idea is to use a project of reconstruction to re rebuild uh, institutions in ways that will avoid a recurrence of conflict. You want to reconstruct states so that the conditions that contributed to conflict will not, uh, will not reemerge. It's a perfectly laudable goal. No one sets out to reconstruct a conflict-affected society in such a way that the conflict will, will spark up again. In, in the very near future. The third big assumption is that because conflict has been so destructive of pre-war state institutions, of pre-war economies, we find that they generate, or the argument is that they generate constituencies in support of reform, local constituencies that have a vested interest in backing projects of state reform and state reconstruction because they see that as the pathway toward uh, overcoming the conditions that led to conflict in the first place. Problem is that when you look at the Middle East, when you look at the conflicts in MENA underway in Yemen, in Libya, and, and Syria, all of these assumptions need to be opened up and examined. Conflict causes a rupture in the organization of an economy. What we see in the Middle East is a very high level of continuity in the underlying organization of economies before and during conflict. I'm not talking about the superficial level in which things don't get destroyed or in which national markets don't fragment. I'm talking about the deeper level of the economic norms and practices that guide economic behavior of average citizens. <laughs> Political economies in all three of the countries in conflict in the Middle East before war were predatory, corrupt, criminal, and coercive. War amplified those attributes in each of those cases. And in fact, further consolidated them as the governing norms that guide economic decision-making and behavior among people in the region. Second, in terms of war as creating space because of its destructive effects to bring about projects of state institutional reform. What we also find in the MENA region is that conflict has empowered actors who have a very strong incentive to use reconstruction funding and use reconstruction processes to rebuild and reimpose the kinds of institutions through which they exercised their power before conflict began. So that while they might openly embrace rhetorically and in order to extract funding from the reconstruction system, support for goals of institutional reform, typically those resources are used to rebuild the kind of uh, political systems that existed prior to conflict 
in, in, a, in a variety of, of, of different ways. Third, it's often the case that the groups that we imagine as the local stakeholders who will serve as constituencies for reform are either very weak and excluded from meaningful arenas of decision making, or that they themselves also have very powerful incentives to use reconstruction as a process for empowering, uh, empowering powerful local actors. And so on each of these different levels that I've, with respect to each of these different assumptions I've discussed, what we find is that models of post-conflict reconstruction that operate on the basis of the assumptions that I set out a moment ago are gonna run into some very, very significant obstacles. The question is, what do we do about it? Now, I don't know how much we wanna get into that now. Let me, let me yeah, I've, I've well. offered a diagnosis You'll just have to stick around if you want to hear the solution. That's all. <laughs> well, Steve, let me ask you a couple of uh, questions. One is, and this is a question from an audience member, uh, to what degree uh, is the integration of what different communities on the ground in an identifying their needs and their priorities in maybe a decentralized fashion, uh, uh, how is that integrated into sort of the usually the rather top-down global World Bank or whatever? So how is yeah. that perspective and priorities of, of these different communities? Yeah. And I don't mean the big, uh, you know, power brokers that you mentioned who want to control the process. You know, how is it? I, I, and the second question is, uh, I mean, in the Middle East, most of the conflicts we're talking about uh, don't look to be ending anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're referring here to you know reconstruction post conflict. Uh, Iraq has been trying to be in post conflict and, and keeps going back into it. To what degree have you examined or tackled the issue of construction, growth, reconstruction while conflict is still going on? Since that's the current reality, uh, we'd love to see the day when it's over and we can we can yeah. uh, do proper reconstruction. Yeah. Those two questions. Th thank you for those. I think they're both very important. There is a great deal of attention within the development field, within, within the field of those who focus on post-conflict reconstruction, to the imperative of participatory decision-making, bottom-up participatory decision-making in processes of post-conflict reconstruction. It's one of the most significant advances, I think, in addressing these issues that we've seen over the last decade or so. My concern is that bottom-up participation continues to be focused around the delivery of state-based strategies of post-conflict reconstruction. And when we think about the MENA region, one of the things we have to recognize is that states represent one of the most significant sources of threat to human security and human development. And so we're inviting citizens, we're inviting grassroots engagement with processes which, if they're subject to the dynamics I described, are very unlikely to produce outcomes that in fact benefit, secure, and improve the life chances of ordinary citizens. And so one of the things that I think we need to be mindful of is the potential for building strategies of reconstruction that include mechanisms to insulate citizens from the predatory, coercive, corrupt practices mm -hmm. of state elites who are ultimately responsible for the implementation of these programs. We, have to, we live in a system in which reconstruction is a state-based project. Right? It is funded by states, it is implemented by state-based agencies, including the World Bank, the United mm -hmm. Nations, and so on. And that state-centric bias, I think, almost inevitably means that even when processes are participatory, we can end up in circumstances in which human security is no more a robust than it was under conditions of conflict. About ongoing conflicts, I, I think there, there are aspects of, um, of reconstruction that we should be thinking about before conflict ends. One uh, it has to do simply with the nuts and bolts of clearing streets, getting schools rebuilt, getting hospitals functioning, getting power infrastructure going. There's, the, there's that element of it that, that, that we often throw into the stabilization bucket. I, 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 don't, I personally don't think there's a big difference between stabilization and reconstruction. I know it's an article of faith here. I, I, I tend not to take it that seriously. 
but the other is a process of mapping and learning about the local governance and local institutional arrangements that have taken shape during conflict during periods when communities were cut off from a central authority and had the possibility for gaining experience in how to manage their own affairs in ways that truly reflected the priorities and concerns of those communities. And, and there, I think, we, we often, although this too, we've seen some improvements in Syria and in Yemen, I think, um, we've seen some improvements in, in taking those experiments seriously and seeing what we can extract from them that might be useful in shifting away from state-centric models of reconstruction to more community-based models in which communities are empowered along lines that give them some means to protect themselves from central authorities who are often their biggest threat. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, Luigi, let me turn to you. You came to this project, and I think, as you mentioned, it began as a conference last year, convening experts on this issue, and you came from the world of diplomacy, not academics. Um, sort of a two-part question. Uh, when you came to this issue, uh, how did you perceive sort of the inherited wisdom about Reconstruction? Uh, and through this project, what did you find was significantly flawed? What, what, are, what are things that you've, you think about differently? Uh, but secondly, as a practitioner and somebody who has worked in, in various countries and as a diplomat, uh, what is the practical, not so much the theoretical, but the practical aspect that you think is key to uh, these takeaways and lessons about Reconstruction. Well, thank you, uh, Paul. First of all, thank you very much for, for uh, organizing this. I think it's very important and timely for uh, Reconstruction is uh, uh, still very high on the agenda and unfortunately will be for a number of years to come. Mm -hmm. The conflicts uh, in the region are, are simply uh, too complex uh, to and require, a lot of reflection is required to really to address the, the consequences uh, in terms of reconstruction and putting back those countries uh, uh, on the development and, and track. Uh, on, on your question, um, it is clear that we as international community have been handling uh, reconstruction following a certain model. So, so it's been come to be defined as liberal peace uh, building model. Uh, indeed, um, there was a sense of uh, sequencing. Uh, conflicts would uh, come to an end, uh, possibly accompanied by a comprehensive uh, settlement with, with, which would uh, handle the, the political uh, dimension through power sharing agreement, and we've seen it in the past. And then uh, the international community would come in uh, supporting a series of measures uh, with a complex toolbox that uh, going from uh, supporting uh, the democratization process in those countries uh, through elections and uh, finding uh, legitimate authorities, looking then at economic uh, rehabilitation and um, rebuilding uh, uh, through macroeconomic stabilization and above all uh, introducing a series of important governance reform that would put the country back on track, possibly attracting foreign, foreign direct investments and uh, allowing uh, also the financial uh, means to, to come in the country to be able to, to uh, reconstruct uh, infrastructure, housing uh, and economy uh, and society. Uh, there, was, there could be a, a transitional justice dimension. Uh, all that we've seen it in practice and has been quietly, uh, quite successful in certain cases, less successful in others. Um, but I think uh, there is a fundamental issue in the conflict in the MENA region uh, today, uh, that the, the scene is no longer um, occupied only by Western thinking. I mean, the, the, there, is, there are quite a number of new actors that are have been implicated in, in the conflicts. We know that the conflict in the Middle East and uh, North Africa have been uh, multidimensional, uh, starting with the local dimension, becoming increasingly regionalized and, and internationalized. And we have a number of players who simply uh, do not believe uh, in, in, uh, in the model. And actually, uh, some of those attribute to some of these uh, um, 
method methodology that has been applied in the past <laughs> as as a cause and a root cause of the cost the the, the current status of a state of of uh, of chaos in the region. Mm -hmm. I mean, we certainly we heard from from uh, from the Russians uh, with a strong uh, emphasis on the fact that uh, the uh, Western-led uh, 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 democratization and regime change policy of the past twenty years have brought about uh, a weakening of the state and and uh, uh, and the conflict and the current state of. Uh, of war, so uh, we, the, the international community fundamentally does not agree uh, mm. on a number of questions. Does not agree on the on the drivers of conflict. Doesn't agree on the solutions to the conflict, uh, and obviously that makes it uh, much more difficult. Uh, to that, we need to add that those conflicts are still ongoing, and mm -hmm. as, as it was mentioned, so there is there is an issue uh, that the, also the sequence that we have been uh, accustomed to see in the past is no longer valid. We have. Uh, uh, conflicts which are ongoing, uh, problems that are uh, uh, daunting for for the in the countries themselves and for the neighboring uh, countries. There are consequences and reverber reverberations on the region uh, and on uh, and uh, and beyond. I mean, uh, so in terms of, uh, for instance, re refugees and migration crisis. Obviously, mm -hmm. that uh, has an impact uh, in Europe and uh, has an impact on even on the. Domestic political scene of, of Europe, as uh, much of the uh, populist and sovereignist uh, parties are uh, basically <coughs> funding themselves on the issue of countering and migration and refugees flows into Europe. So that that is that's a major uh, issue that, that um, the basis that, that was shared in, in the past is no longer there, and we need to look at uh, at ways in which uh, there can be uh, intervention uh, which uh, try to address some of the issues uh, in, in a situation where also there is a lot of doubts about uh, the uh, fundamental viability of the peace and the liberal peace building model which have led us into uh, prolonged uh, state uh, aid dependence in some of these countries uh, no exit strategy to a number of issues of countries that is particularly uh, valid in the US, but we had also in the Balkans, so we have similar uh, situations. Uh, uh, so, so there are doubts uh, and uh, uh, which com are compounded by uh, what is known as uh, reconstruction fatigue. Mm -hmm. uh, we have mm -hmm. witnessed so many uh, crises coming uh, to the fore that uh, the, there is uh, clearly a difficulty on the part of the international community to come up with the necessary funding, prolonged engagement, and willingness to accompany a, a, a process. To that, of course, we need to add the political, economic dynamic in, dynamics in, in uh, conflict countries uh, lead towards uh, uh, reconstitution of authoritarian uh, political authorities, which, of course, makes it very difficult for the international community to push forward an, mm -hmm. a, 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 an agenda of, uh, that can lead to transition and, and democratization and reconstruction. So that is uh, an extremely complex uh, uh, setting. Uh, uh, and yet, uh, I think uh, action is, is necessary. I don't think uh, uh, turning, mm -hmm. turning the eyes away uh, to, from the conflict is, is a solution, uh, especially not in Europe, which are very, very close, and, and uh, the, the repercussions are... are well, let me I mean, ask you a couple of questions as follow-on. One as relates to how close some of these conflicts are to, to Europe, particularly the case, obviously, of Libya and Syria, both of which are physically very close and have, particularly in the Syrian case, was a big refugee crisis <laughs> that impacted uh, uh, the EU and the, you know, Europe in general. Uh, in the current... Western situation where the U.S. administration is completely sort of disengaged and not willing to countenance reconstruction or any investment of any kind, and is also through its immigration policy cut itself off from the risk of refugees and so on. Uh, and the EU is sort of left on its own, uh, potentially grappling with the issues of Libya and, and Syria in terms of reconstruction. In both cases, there are obvious political obstacles. In the Syrian case, uh, the Assad regime. In Libya, the absence of a, of a settlement. 
Uh, but if you could say a few words about how you or Europe, you know, given all that's going through, is trying to find its way in dampening the effects of Libya and Syria and trying to consider issues of reconstruction. My second question, you say the liberal model is not now the globally, you know, there's no consensus about it. Uh, the two other global players obviously being China and Russia. Uh, Russia doesn't really have money to do any reconstruction, uh, but China does. Uh, China has one road, one belt, does the part, many things. Uh, do you perceive, uh, do you see any Chinese model uh, in reconstruction? We see it in investment and trade. Uh, have you seen anything towards Syria that would indicate the Chinese are offering any reconstruction model post-conflict? That, that, that's very important indeed. Um, um, of the major international players, uh, uh, Russia uh, is uh, seem to be of course, to the fore in terms of uh, its uh, involvement in, in, the, in the Syria uh, conflict. Uh, we have lately seen uh, an, an increasing involvement in the Libya conflict. Uh, yep. we've recently, even with the attempt to, to broker a ceasefire, uh, that definitely shows uh, an extreme capacity to take advantage of the opportunities created by the current setting and increase uh, uh, sense of vacuum uh, from the part of uh, uh, both the US and, and, and Europe. Uh, uh, and yet we, we know for a fact that uh, Russia does not have uh, the willingness nor uh, the, the money to, mm -hmm. to be able to afford uh, the, the daunting task of reconstruction in, in the case of Syria, for instance. Uh, the, the, this, there is clearly, uh, again, perhaps an opportunistic uh, approach there, trying to take advantage of some of the uh, opportunities that come about uh, in reconstruction, but it's certainly not uh, a long-term strategy, nor the capacity to come mm -hmm. up with the funding. So uh, eventually, uh, the, the issue of uh, who pays for reconstruction, we, we come back to the the four, and that's where uh, Europe is, uh, for instance, in the case of, of Syria, where I mean, they're, they're clearly um, uh, the, the EU and member states have set clear conditions to, to be able to uh, intervene in, in the reconstruction of, Sh of Syria, and those conditions are mostly of political nature, and they are not. There. not there. So, yeah. so that uh, that will uh, create a clearly a, 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 pro a problem is uh, there is prolonging the issue of. Uh, of, of uh, uh, how to go about uh, the, the problems of the people uh, and, and the problems that have re uh, repercussions uh, on neighboring countries and perhaps in Europe. Um, Europe is, uh, has been um, uh, clearly uh, not uh, sufficiently uh, active in, in, those, in, in the conflicts. And we've seen it in the case of, of Libya. Mm -hmm. uh, over the weekend, we'll have a, a conference in, in Germany uh, to look at, uh, at, uh, at the Libya uh, process, at the time, an attempt to relaunch it. Uh, but we see that other powers uh, uh, take the initiative. So there, there can only be uh, a convergence uh, if the conditions present themselves in Europe uh, is uh, clearly a witness that its will willingness not to be become the uh, the pay uh, the, mm -hmm. the paying power the bank, of, yeah. the bank mm -hmm. of, of of reconstruction if the conditions are not there. But that creates obviously a, 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 a question of uh, how to to solve the, to address the, the issues mm -hmm. that remain on the table. And on the Chinese, uh... the Chinese is, is interesting. Uh, China uh, is uh, uh, has become uh, by default uh, a major uh, reference in the region, uh, not only in conflict countries. Uh, by the way, I think uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is, uh, is uh, uh, extremely tempting uh, uh, amongst uh, uh, countries in, in the region. Um, uh, yet, China is not willing to get involved uh, in traditional terms in, in reconstruction, nor uh, China seems to be particularly interested in the type of reforms uh, that are needed to create a proper environment for, for reconstruction uh, and rebuilding of the economies. So there is an offer, 
that uh, as an appeal, a strong mm -hmm. appeal amongst uh, uh, Arab countries, uh, in conflict countries, which has not yet materialized in anything concrete, but represents an alternative model even in the long run. Uh, so that creates further difficulties for the, the Western uh, uh, approach to uh, try to uh, negotiate or bring into the picture uh, uh, the need for uh, uh, having a, a comprehensive reforms that accompany reconstruction. So okay. that's, that's the word. Thank you, Luigi. Francesca, uh, let me turn to you. The Building for Peace project at the World Bank has been ongoing for about two years, uh, hopefully three years. three years now. It was led by our colleague and friend, Dr. Abdullah Derderi, uh, who's now gone, to, gone on to a position in Afghanistan with UNDP. Uh, share with us some of the core sort of findings before it's published in February. Uh, what have you found? What have you found that's new uh, in the literature and the practice of reconstruction? And what have you found that's specific to the Middle East and North Africa and would not necessarily apply or was only learned by looking at, uh, at these, uh, these cases? I know you have a few slides that you want to show from the podium. Is that the case or not? Yes, let me... So um, feel free to do that. If, uh, just let me, just for the sake of uh, helping. And thank you for mentioning uh, our colleague Abdallah. Yes. Uh, I, I wanted to show a couple of slides. Uh, um, and just to give an overview of this work that has been ongoing for three years, it has uh, benefited from the intellectual leadership of our colleague Abdallah al Dardari that now has left us, the support of the World Bank, but mostly the German government, and of many research organizations and NGOs working in the Middle East that has helped us to think outside the box. I'm here representing a team much wider than myself. I think that there are two mics, and that's why we are having an echo. Let's see. That's better, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, and I think that also I wanted to link to one of the questions that was posed by someone in the audience. I also wanted to thank all the citizens in Iraq, in Libya, and in Yemen who participated and shared their thoughts with us, more than 15,000, through an online survey to help us to think differently. Our starting point was uh, we are unable as development organization to support the country to break out of the cycle of violence. We can help to stabilize for a few years and then there is a relapse into violence. What are we doing that we should be doing differently? What should we stop doing? What should we be doing that, you know, is actually creating the condition for a relapse into conflict? And, and I think that starting from this point, we really had more than 20 years of experience looking and supporting country, trying to emerge from conflict and moving towards sustainable peace. And I'm being very deliberate in the choice of words that I have, in part because we also have benefited from the work that Steve and Luigi have done. And I'm very conscious about the difference that there is between rebuilding and building. And uh, here, let me share a couple of thoughts uh, on this. Our starting point was really this idea, we are in a fragility trap. We keep on uh, stabilizing without really helping the countries, and I'm talking about the countries, not just the government, uh, to really be able to move towards sustainable peace, growth, inclusive for every member of their society. What can we do differently? And I think that what I would like to share with you, this is part of the work that we did and we're really, we try to reach out to the everyday citizen and technology today help us to do that, to really listen to the voice of those that are in the conflict, the citizen, the people, asking them, what could we be doing differently? What do you need? What are the assets available? And you can see that to actually complement and echo what was said before, both by Luigi and Steve, 
part of the what was has been missing in the past is a sense of vision, a vision that really was able to guide both the government, the communities, and the people, and the opportunity to change the economy, um, and the inclusion of all the uh, various segments of society. These are the organizations, including the Middle East Institute that hosts us today, that have supported us over the past three years with their work and their thinking. This is what I want to emphasize. The question we are asking today are extremely complex. And to think that one organization can answer it uh, is a little bit naive. And we really try to bring together the work and the expertise of many because we felt that, that we couldn't tackle this question on our own. And these are what actually, let me focus on this, on the emerging messages. Think about people. It is true, we cannot go top down and think only about the center of government. We are actually saying, let's complement it with a bottom-up approach that put people at the center, every different group of citizen. So my organization, the World Bank, and many of the donor partners often have a group of counterparts, a group of uh, agents in the country that we engage with, we talk to. We need to be broader. We need to find way to talk to also with those that traditionally we haven't been talking. Because we need to understand what the challenges are, the grievances that have not been addressed are, and how we can start to think about bringing together different parts of the society. So people. But we also need, as have been emphasized, not just go at the national level, we need and manner in the, the Middle East really make us look very much at this point. We need to go at the community level, at the local level, but also at the international level. Some of the conflict and the situation of conflict that, that we are trying to address cannot be addressed unless we go at the regional level, beyond the national government, and while understanding the local dynamics. We also need, and this is what we really would like to stress, to link past, present, and future. What do we mean? Often we think about that there is a conflict that emerged because there were some causes, some challenges. Let's address the past grievances. So we look at the past and we look at today where we are. The additional element that we stress is we also need to understand that what we do today, the decision I make today, whether to invest in a certain sector or in one city, will have an impact on where the country and the community will be 10 years down the road. The policy decision that we are making today have an impact on the country, whether the country can really move slowly but continuously toward growth and inclusive pace, or whether we are actually recreating, we are allocating powers among actors that then will exclude growth for people. So let me stop. Uh, thank you, uh, Francesca. I'm sure you have much more to say, and I'll ask you a couple of questions to give you more of a chance. And let me include some of the questions from the audience. Uh, I think one of them you may have answered, which is, does the World Bank have the tools to take into account the local needs and so on. I think you've addressed that uh, quite well. Uh, another question related to the same issue, is there the risk of putting too much on local communities and, mm -hmm. uh, and hence burdening, burdening them and you know, not enabling them to carry what needs to be carried? Have you encountered that? What types of things are those that are too burdensome uh, and have been mistakes in the past if you could address that? So let me start from uh, this question and then go back to how we could engage. Um, I actually think, and here I'm pushing back a little bit on the initial comments that they were made, um, we always think about conflict uh, and country in conflict, uh, country that have needs <coughs> and damages, where there is an extensive amount of destruction. And we don't realize that because there conflict and the tension has been quite prolonged, um, 
the communities and the people in this country have actually been able to create some solution and they have used their own assets, either skill that they had, a particular network. And I would like to urge everybody to think differently and to think about the not only the damage that there is in Yemen or in Libya, let's think about the assets that are already there and that we could build upon. Because if we think only about damage, at first we look back and we are thinking damage with respect to what was destroyed, so we are trying to rebuild what was in the past. And we might actually overlook some of these assets, some of this economic opportunity network for trading that are there even in during the conflict and during this tension. And I think that that is what I would like to, to start to think as a frame, a frame of mind. And this goes back to the question, are we overburdening too much the local government or the local community? <laughs> These community, even while there is conflict, they continue to operate to some extent. And I think that to complement and support these community and local government while trying to find a solution at the national level, it's actually the way to bring together the two. And I think that this is a very important point. In terms of communicating and including everybody in our conversation, it is, I'm not gonna uh, try to be politically correct. For an organization like the World Bank, it's incredibly difficult to be able to talk and reach all the different parties and citizens in this conflict. But as I was saying, we have so many tools and we have partners. If I cannot, uh, we have digital tools, technology, like you're using to pose your question today. Um, and you also, we can also collaborate more closely with other partners that don't have a limitation in the mandate or the authority that the World Bank has, but have the information. If I cannot talk with a certain government, with a part of the government, with the, what we call them in very, uh, in this jargon, non-state actor, right? Then maybe the Middle East Institute can, maybe other organization can. What is important is that the choice, the intervention that we develop will be informed by this information. So I also am urging the importance of creating partnership among the different uh, groups uh, to try to have a greater impact on the ground. Thank you, Francesca. Ross, let me turn to you. Uh, in your uh, uh, work on the civil wars, as well as our work previously on regional conflict and cooperation, you've emphasized uh, a lot the, the issue of a conflict trap, that there mm -hmm. is a regional conflict, as it were, maybe it's a regional civil war, you might call it, uh, which uh, partly drives these civil wars, uh, or is even driven by them because they are vacuums that pull countries in. Now, when we think about reconstruction, uh, uh, reconstruction also has to have an environment that enables it and encourages it. What would you identify as the key uh, regional and global, international, as Luigi was mentioning, there used to be a consensus, not so much, there is the World Bank, but there are other players. What are the key regional and international uh, uh, you know, elements that you think are, are critical? Okay, thank you, Paul, and I wanna thank my fellow panelists, it's an honor to be here with you today. Um, you know, I want to pick up on a comment that Francesca made about the role of regional actors and global actors in setting the broader context for reconstruction and stabilization. Uh, one of the things that we did in our book uh, is we sort of challenged the question uh, or the notion of how regional, what role regional actors play in the civil war zones. Because if we don't challenge sort of what is the what, are, what is the dynamic between the regional actors, the global actors, and what's happening on the ground in the civil wars? If we don't have the right di diagnoses, we're unlikely to come up with the right solutions, or we're gonna come up with solutions that might not be germane or might, might not be build traction at the local level. So one of the things that we do in the book is we challenge the notion of the, civil, the, the, the regional involvement in the civil wars being purely a proxy dynamic. 
If you think about what the assumptions are about a proxy dynamic, it's that the regional actors, the, the sort of the healthy actors in the region, when I say major regional actors, I mean Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey, Israel, and a few others, depending upon which civil war we're talking about. The notion is that they are healthy, strong, troubled, but in, in, in certainly in a better state than the countries that are in civil war. And they will push their rivalry between each other down into the civil war zones, into the vulnerable sort of underbelly of the Middle East. And part of that is true. That model uh, kind of mimics the model we had during the Cold War, which was that the United States and the Soviet Union wanting to deflect conflict from the nuclear reality between each other, kind of push conflict down into what we call the third world in the Middle East. And maybe the Middle Eastern regional powers picked up on that and kind of are doing the same thing inside their own region. Uh, so that's, that's an assumption uh, of, of what is actually happening between the regional powers and the civil wars. And it's kind of a top-down thing. The, civil, the regional actors didn't start the civil wars, but they certainly have tacked onto them or, or um, have used those civil wars as venues for creating regional influence with one another. Uh, the corollary to that kind of a model is, well, here, here's what we need to do. We need to change that behavior. We need to get alignment between the international actors and the regional actors. And if we can do that, if we can get the international actors on the same page, something we don't have today, but if we could, then we might have a fighting chance to get the regional actors uh, to at least have a modicum of cooperation in order to kind of defuse some of these conflicts. Uh, if only it were so easy. The, the, first of all, we don't have that kind of cooperation on either any of the levels, but even if we did, I think the situation, the model of a proxy dynamic, the situation is far more ambiguous and far more complex because, as Paul alluded to, one of the things that we identify in the book is something called the regional uh, conflict complex or regional trap. We called it in the World Bank report vertical contagion. The notion that the conflicts on the ground in the civil war zones are actually giving back to the regional powers. It's not just the regional powers pushing conflict down, it's that the conflict zones in the Middle East, the, 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 the civil wars in Syria, Libya, Yemen, Iraq, those conflicts are giving back to the region. They're defining the region, and in fact, they're creating regional disorder. And that regional disorder is it sort of un, creates a sort of unvirtuous cycle of the regional actors pushing conflict into the civil war zones with proxy armies and, and aid and all sorts of things that they do to help fuel the conflict, or at least create an advantage of the conflict, but then the conflict is giving back to the region, sowing many of the divisions at the regional level. Now you might say, well wait, wait, even before the civil wars, we had conflicts between Saudi Arabia and Iran, we had tension between Israel and Iran, we had regional tension, so to say that somehow the civil wars have spawned that is, is, is spurious kind of, of, of logic. Uh, and there's an element of truth to that. However, look at what has happened since the civil wars. The conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran has become greater, more accentuated, more, uh, more violent even recently with, with the attacks on the Epcot facilities and, and Saudi Aramco. Um, so that conflict went from a intense rivalry to potentially a blood sport. Look at the Israeli-Iranian uh, uh, competition in the region, yes, high vitriol, lots of tension. You might say they were blood enemies, but they didn't spill blood. But the civil war in Syria has drawn in, obviously drawn in Iran, and it's also drawn in reluctantly, only in the last year, and a year and a half or so, drawn in Israel to attack Iranian positions in Syria. Uh, all of which have sort of increased the likelihood of more tension and more potential warfare between these regional powers, but also widened the gap and made it increasingly difficult for any kind of eventual cooperation. Uh, I don't have to go a lot further, but I will just briefly, in the Libyan civil war, right, the, the, the situation between Qatar and its other GCC brethren, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Bahrain, that conflict has had has many roots, but the Libyan civil war with the UAE, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, um, on one side of the conflict, and Qatar and Turkey on the other side of the conflict, has again made resolution of these regional tensions increasingly difficult. So in effect, what we have is a situation where the sickness, if you might use a biological model at the country level, has kind of infected the region in a way. 
And why is this important in terms of reconstruction? It's important because if you think about the model, what, what was said by Steve and, Stephen and Luigi and Francesca, either implicitly or explicitly, is you need some alignment between actors at the international level, the global level, the United States, Europe, China, Russia. You need alignment between their activities, alignment at the regional level between the major regional powers, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey, and Israel, as far-fetched as it might seem, I know. Uh, you need to have some kind of alignment, some kind of cooperation, in order to build the kind of sustainable traction that we need on the ground for reconstruction. And the, 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 the fact that was mentioned earlier about the civil wars not really coming to an end, but maybe be, being a, becoming a chronic state of affairs in the Middle East is problematic because it's this unvirtuous cycle of the regional powers pursuing their interests in the civil war zones and the civil wars giving back and increasingly increasing the fissures or the, div the divides within the regional, among the regional actors that makes it very, very difficult to break out of this. And I think that is the challenge of diplomacy, is to try to break that unvirtuous cycle and escape the conflict. Right? Thank you, Ross. Let me ask a question that came from an audience member, but it's also something. I told you everything I know, so yeah, I didn't. Well, <laughs> I'll give it a second shot. <laughs> uh, the question is, uh, it's been said that security uh, is 90% of the problem, uh, uh, but only 10% of the solution, in the sense that in reconstruction, obviously you need if you don't have security, that's 90% of the, the battle lost. Uh, can the MENA communities be effectively rebuilt before the conflict ends or security is provided? Now let me link that question to the work of the book, which was really about ending uh, the civil wars mm -hmm. in the Middle East. Uh, we know, maybe except for Iraq, uh, they have not ended, and even Iraq is a bit on and off. Uh, maybe you can communicate to the audience just a few bullet points uh, about sort of the Libyan and, and Yemeni cases, which maybe are a bit closer potentially to resolution, and the Syrian case, how was that dealt with uh, in the book, in your view? Well, I think there are certain conflicts that we kind of left, um, you know, uh, we went to a bar after we wrote those chapters on, uh, certainly on the, the concluding chapter, we were talking about Afghanistan and Syria, we saw very few critical paths out we weren't necessarily predicting they would not end, but we could not see on the ground certain pathways out. We saw pathways out for Yemen. Uh, Jerry, Ambassador Feierstein did, and we kind of brought that into our conclusion. And we saw a certain similarity on the, in the Libyan case, uh, but the, it didn't make us any more optimistic because even though there were potential critical paths, the lack of political will and the lack and the, 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 the regional conditions that actually worked against the regional actors having political will, even if there was a, even if there is a solution in sight, uh, made us, you know, equally pessimistic about those conflicts. But the question you asked started out was about ninety percent not security, ten percent security. Is that well, what it was? I mean, without security, you can't do reconstruction. So you need the conflict to yeah. end. I mean, yeah. Well, and that's that's one of the yeah. other pieces of the book that led us to this pessimistic conclusion is that we're likely to mo many of these conflicts. We may, the best case scenario might be to reduce the levels of conflict, but not end the war, because the two, the two kind of ultimate outcomes or ways in which civil war end traditionally has been either a negotiated peace among the warring parties or some kind of outright victory, one side or the other. Uh, Syria, you may have, you certainly have the Assad government that has, uh, is in power, but it's not a full victory. It's still a partial victory. So you're likely to see in many of these cases uh, civil wars to continue, still continuing this problematic condition at the region, but also requiring some of the, I think some of the creative kinds of things that we heard from the rest of the panel, which is working with local communities uh, who are kind of have over time have hived themselves off from the central government, uh, making ways, giving them ways to, to you know, get transport services moving and distribution and trying maybe to bring some refugees back in some, in some limited cases um, at the human level, um, even though while the, the a overall overarching solution will be elusive. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Ross. Uh, Steve, let me turn back to you and integrate a question that was asked by uh, 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 an audience member and add to it another component. This relates to the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. uh, the question itself is about uh, the U.S. Congress. Let me find it here. 
Um, given the complex reality of reconstruction in the Middle East, what course of action would the panelists recommend that congressional members take in this regard to enhance uh, regional security or relations with the U.S.? Maybe the question is, in fact, maybe you know, not exactly your job to answer that, but from what you know about uh, the funding that Congress gives, certainly mm -hmm. in the humanitarian aid and so on, has there been any thinking there or priority given to planning for reconstruction? Uh, and let me also ask at the level of administrations, uh, the Obama administration and or the Trump administration, do you see the U.S. at all engaged in any reconstruction thinking or efforts? We know they're engaged in humanitarian aid. We know they're engaged in stabilization here and there. So what would you say about the U.S. Uh, role in this area? Yeah, you know, I, I think the, the, the congressional role is, is extraordinarily complicated because of the uh, significant differences in existing legislative and legal circumstances that um, in some respects regulate and govern how the U.S. engages financially, economically in terms of loans, support assistance to each of these different countries. Mm -hmm. If you take the Syrian case, for example, the possibility of moving beyond provision of humanitarian support, an area in which the U.S. has been quite generous, to think about more substantive engagement in reconstruction faces such extraordinary obstacles because of the Caesar Sanctions Act, because of other, uh, other um, sanctions that have been in place since 1979. Uh, Syria was one of the first three countries to be put on the list of sp state sponsors of terror when that list was created in 1979. It's the only one of the three never to have been taken off. So there is a dense web of constraints, legal and others, um, that would, I think, need to be addressed before it might be possible to imagine the U.S. Uh, playing a significant role in reconstruction in the case of, of Syria. And because of those legal restrictions, even a private sector role would, I think, be somewhat more difficult to imagine. I, it, it's, it's clear why the EU has become the principal focus of interest for support for reconstruction for Syria, because I think the opportunities on the U.S. side are, are small. With respect to Yemen and, and Libya, I, I, I can imagine, uh, depending on how those, those um, conflicts ultimately end, um, that the possibilities for U.S. support for and engagement in reconstruction um, might be might be larger. Uh, I think I, I think in, in in both cases, however, um, what Congress will probably want to do uh, is to work through the existing policy system to uh, to expect that USAID would uh, take the lead role um, in managing reconstruction activities. Uh, I suspect that under current budget circumstances and given the general uh, interest in not further deepening U.S. engagement in the region, um, the perception that reconstruction might be a slippery slope that would lead to the U.S. taking on commitments that, that I think the American public look at with a great deal of wariness would, would to some extent, um, uh, would be seen by Congress as, as uh, constraining the, the degree to which it, it, it might be willing to become involved. And, and I would anticipate, because there is a great deal of concern about corruption in, in all of these countries, about the way in which U.S. funds have been used in the past, that Congress would uh, invest significantly in its oversight function uh, of any kind of funding efforts mm -hmm. uh, that it would support. I think we have to recognize that, that financially, in dollar terms, the carrying capacity of the U.S. system for reconstruction support is fairly limited. I mean, I, you know, if it, 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 we're talking about at the most a figure of billion, two, three, four, five billion dollars in support of countries where reconstruction needs are in the tens or hundreds of billions. So, for a variety of reasons, I, I, I can imagine. That the U.S. would approach each of Congress would approach each of these conflicts on a case by case basis, um, would look to the existing <coughs> policy apparatus as the mechanism for engaging in reconstruction, would do so to a limited extent, 
um, and would want to put robust oversight measures in place where it did engage to ensure that funds were being effectively used. But that, that strikes me off the cuff as, as someone who's not a, an expert on Congress by any means as what we might expect to see in that regard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Steve. Uh, this might be a question for Luigi and, uh, and or Francesca. Uh, an audience member, uh, uh, how much do the administrations of major Western countries matter to a sustainable process of reconstruction given politics of Trump or Brexit or other domestic concerns? Uh, and what, how differentiated is then the roles of international organizations, transnational organizations, EU as a collective, uh, or international NGOs? Can there be some distance between you know, the domestic politics of these governments and what different institutions do? Uh, what would your response <coughs> be? Well, there, there is clearly a, a, an effect of uh, the type of uh, uh, government uh, or political forces in, in government uh, uh, can have on the willingness to engage. We've mm -hmm. seen it uh, at play in Europe, uh, of course, uh, over the past uh, uh, few years. Uh, uh, the focus on uh, uh, sort of uh, domestic uh, uh, issues created by uh, the presence of strong uh, uh, populist forces which uh, they believe that, that, that have certainly diminished the, the willingness of, the, of European countries to get involved, both diplomatically and in terms of uh, funding for, for reconstruction. Uh, that uh, plays uh, into also uh, the dynamics of uh, uh, international organizations, because governments are represented in these international organizations. In the, in the case of the EU, of course, uh, it is clearly a, a reflection of the political willingness of member states mm -hmm. to, to engage. So the, yes, indeed, plays a role. Uh, uh, and yet, uh, th there is a space for uh, continuing engagement. And I, I would play, uh, I think, on, on, on this particular uh, note, there is a uh, an increasing uh, space for for intervening, perhaps at more at the community level, which uh, which has has been uh, said by Francesca, uh, can can also uh, be uh, a response to the the needs that and and the challenges uh, deriving from from those conflicts uh, uh, with a different type of approach. And there, uh, international NGOs uh, do play an important role. Uh, in in, uh, in the European context, I will continue to play that mm -hmm. uh, over, the, over the years. Okay, thank you. Do you have a response to that, uh, Francesca? I mean, do you see the bank as a direct, I mean, obviously it's governed by the representatives of the governments that are members of it. Is there any distance whatsoever? Are you able to have a role that's more sustained than the politics of the member countries? Or are you not even allowed to answer that question? No, I am. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I was reflecting because I think that we are bringing together many different international organizations. They have different mandates. So the World Bank, uh, if we go by the book, is a development uh, organization. Other are more humanitarian with a different mandate. But I think that where we are all coming after a decades of prolonged uh, conflict is to the realization that we need to think a little bit outside our own mandate, which is the reason why this work has been done within also the World Bank. And to start to think if we wait in the developmental world, we should wait for a clear peace agreement to be signed, security to be there, and then we step in. If we do that, power has already been allocated through the negotiation of the peace agreement. And we have a very limited space to operate and to really go toward our uh, objective of support to sustainable peace. So we are realizing, and this is actually something that is happening internally in, in several of these international organizations, collectively we are thinking, we are rethinking when to engage, how to engage. The World Bank has just finished to develop is new strategy for engagement in fragile and conflict-affected country that was brought and supported by the board that is our governing body 
And it did pose this question and it got the full support. We need to stay engaged even during conflict. This is one of the four pillars of this strategy. We need to understand and help to prevent relapse into conflict. And we need to think differently with whom to engage. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, let me ask you a follow-up question from one of the audience members as well. Um, and it maybe was touched on, but maybe you can go a bit deeper. Um, I mean, the question is posed, does reconstruction start from within or something that the international community you know, brings as uh, from outside? Or, and, and to delve deeper, how important is the issue of who is the driving momentum in a way, who owns it is the, and, and how do you try to affect that dynamic? Obviously, there's the risk that, you know, the conflict ends, the World Bank comes with money, here we are to help you, and then they become recipients or they abuse the money for their own power purposes. Uh, what's the model you try to shoot for? How much can it be domestically driven? And how much is that domestic drivenness a positive thing or it could be a negative thing if there are elites that are driving it in the wrong direction. How do you grapple with that challenge? So this uh, is connected to the point I was making before that we need to be better informed when we make this decision. And this is part of what we have realized that our the World Bank effort and support in this country, even beyond the Middle East, uh, that were trying to emerge from conflict, um, it was had relied on partial information. And this really triggered our inability and partial effectiveness to really support the country. So should it be coming from within? Should it be driven by external effort? Should it be... I think that our understanding and our approach stress the importance to be very pragmatic. There is not one solution. There is not that let's always be going in and giving guidance and helping to develop a strategy. There is not always the approach or oh, only domestically solution will come because it will depend on who is interested in peace. Uh, it will depend on the resource available. It will depend on the opportunity that we have to have a dialogue and on what is the situation on the ground. And all that will depend on will depend on the information that we can collect. And this goes back to the point I was making before. We need to be able to talk to almost everybody, if not everybody. And that is incredibly challenging. But um, I can come up with cases where the international community did not intervene and actually probably was better. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, and other cases where instead the international community intervene, but not with a top-down <coughs> approach, but with a very selective approach, focusing on certain areas where conflict was present, even outside the Middle Eastern region. Here I'm thinking actually the case of Colombia. And that helped. So I think that we need to be extremely pragmatic of what is the window of opportunity that we have. And we, I want to go back to what Steve was saying before, and who has power? And who is interested in to keep in power? And who might be damaged and affected negatively by peace? And this is actually a group of people that we often don't talk about it and don't bring it into the picture. I think that one of the points that Steve was making at the beginning, that there is this assumption that war destroyed the economy. But actually, it might destroy one part of the economy and it creates a whole other economy that has absolutely no interest in peace. And if we don't recognize this, then to have a domestic driven approach or an internationally driven approach, it doesn't help. It will not get us mm. anywhere. Well, let me ask you, Francesca, if in the research and experience of the bank, to pick up on something Steve said, and maybe a bit obvious, that the size and the amount of money that's needed for reconstruction in the Middle East is way beyond any member country, way, way beyond. Uh, let alone the politics about there, the conflicts, all of that. So the question is, uh, what does it mean? What if there is no reconstruction? I mean, what if we're in a world 
uh, you know, let's say the Syrian war ends or the Yemeni war ends, and there's a trickle of some money, but effectively there isn't that traditional, the world comes in and, you know, within five to 10 years, everything's, everything's built and whatnot. Are there examples and what, what has been most striking about examples where post-conflict societies have been left in their devastation to evolve as they will? Um, a bit of a macabre question. Yes, a little bit. That, but, um, <laughs> um, sorry about that. No, no, I, but I think that is an important point. And there is this realization, and I think that, that you and I and with the team have talked about this. Well, we can contribute to the World Bank or the US government or even all the government together is a drop of what is needed in many of these countries and uh, in terms of financial resources. But what, for example, the World Bank is trying to push more is to actually to connect, to connect people, to connect skill, to connect assets, and to think deliberately, for example, what should be done given the limited resources available that is really a high priority to start to deflect the country to a path mm. of peace. To leverage something. To leverage. Yeah. And that is very important. And I yeah. think that this is where we need to realize. Resources are limited, but we need to actually use it for establishing the foundation of what will have been the institution or the power allocation that will be more inclusive and will really steer the country in a different place. Let me give you a concrete example. And this is from work that the World Bank is doing in Yemen. Often, war destroyed all the power network to distribute electricity. We go in, traditional approach, we rebuild the whole power network. We have done it, it gets bombed, we re-go in, we rebuild, right? In Yemen now, the team had thought, let's have microgrid of solar power. They thought that from an energy point of view, right? What they didn't realize, and it was the beauty of this until we pointed out, and thanks again to your helpful thinking, Steve, was that they were breaking the network of power. The overall countrywide network, national network of energy distribution was excluding part of the population, part of the actor. By adding microgrid of sustainable energy, you start to break these power networks. And you start to create a completely different dynamics where people can have access to energy, can start to think about economic opportunity, and they are not excluded. Limited resources, they really have a greater impact and they can mm -hmm. be leveraged mm -hmm. for a sustainable peace. Paul, Thank can you. I, can, Steve? I just <laughs> wanted to follow up quickly because I think this will I be was really surprised she said there's helpful thinking that you come up with. Right? <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I made a note of that. I, I, I like to think that most of my my contributions are actually counterproductive, but. I okay. know. <laughs> um, no, but, but something very important uh, about what Francesca said, which is. It, this gap between the, the, the um, needs and the resources can somehow be a little bit misleading. And that has to do with the power, the influence that small contributions can have in shaping larger, larger processes and in laying out pathways that then can gain momentum over time. And setting examples, creating incentives, providing starting points that can then serve to, um, to uh, uh, accelerate processes along a given path. And I don't think any of the actors who invest in post-conflict reconstruction imagine they're gonna foot the bill. What they're trying to do is establish clearly through the investments they do make, what the process priorities, um, strategies of engagement need to be for a successful process to emerge. The other, the other really very troubling um, piece of the question you asked is what happens if there's no reconstruction funding? And, and, and to me, in many ways, I think what we have to anticipate is that because actors arrive at post-conflict with very different endowments in terms of their influence, their leverage, whether they've been able to, to hold on to assets throughout a conflict or accumulate new ones, the networks they're plugged into in, 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 from pre-conflict or, or conflict uh, phases, 
the differences in these endowments will create vast disparities in how different categories of a population experience reconstruction. And to me, that will lead to the reproduction of hierarchies of inclusion and exclusion, of, of, um, of privilege and of discrimination and marginalization. And so we face this incredibly difficult challenge of engaging in ways to try to mitigate some of those effects, and yet doing so in a way that will not lead to some of these counterproductive outcomes that I suggested at the beginning. And at the moment, figuring out how to thread those needles it needs a lot more work. We haven't really made the kind of progress we need to in those areas yet. They need a lot more work. Well, yes, Luigi. A small interje interjection on, on this. Uh, there is a, another aspect, uh, another dimension of privileging uh, intervention uh, sort of at the community micro level, which is uh, the capacity to support uh, the people uh, and the actors who, who have been active uh, and recognized already from the community and provide them with uh, funding and legitimation for to continue to expand their work. That is also another element can can be helpful in breaking the, the power networks that otherwise would reproduce the same uh, mm -hmm. type of it. And, and it's it's something that it's happening in, the, in, in uh, local communities, in, in conflict countries, while conflicts are ongoing. You've seen it in Libya, where, uh, where at community level you, you see a, a number of interesting uh, personalities and uh, that have, are linked to the local communal structure, the tribal structure, sometimes even the militia structure, that they may be uh, incentivized in producing uh, useful alternative economic uh, models which can, can bring the communities up and is increase the societal resi resilience. Uh, yeah, thank so you, good. Luigi. Uh, Ross, uh, yeah, I wanted to, and if you want to comment on that, yeah, I have I a question. Uh, from the audience that I also want to elaborate on, the question was rather straightforward in light of regional and international tensions and conflicts or over conflicts. Who exactly should fund and manage reconstruction? The way I want to pitch that question uh, uh, is the following. In the context of your own writing, in the Cold War, there were clear, you know, the U.S. would have a stake in the countries that were in its sphere and presumably spend some money on them for its own interests. Soviet Union would do the same. For a period in the post-Cold War, uh, when the United Nations Security Council, there was still up till 2014, cooperation and so on, the United Nations and hence the World Bank and there was a global order that was functioning to some degree. At the global level right now, the US, particularly President, President Trump is saying, you know, I just, it's just the US. I'm concerned about the US. If I have a particular narrow interest elsewhere, I might. But uh, Trump, let alone worry about the global order, he's not even worried about US allies or US regions of influence. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Russians don't have an empire, they have interests and in, in trade. Uh, so, by, at the global level, the global system has changed within which reconstruction doesn't seem to have a constituency other than nice people at the World Bank and so on. So how would you reflect on that? Uh, uh, and regionally, again, something we've both written uh, about, uh, maybe there's a different pattern that Iran does now have a sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. uh, Saudi Arabia has a bit of, you know, they feel Yemen is part of theirs. Mm -hmm. They still say, we'll offer reconstruction mm -hmm. once it's over. But the region is also changing in such a way that this question, who pays for it, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's no longer the old world, well, the US and Europe. And, uh, so how, how do you situate the challenge of reconstruction in a world order, in a regional order, which is which nobody yeah. has ownership of anything? OK, so I'm not an economist, and I don't focus on reconstruction. So talking about sort of member contributions, uh, I would be outside my wheelhouse. Let me say this, that I think in the past, the United States, even if it wasn't contributing significant assets, or in the case of Israel-Palestine, impartial kinds of solutions, they had the power to convene and they had played the role of plausible broker. Uh, I think that's been compromised uh, by the Trump administration, quite frankly. Um, that the United States has, has 
has had a degradation of its diplomatic capacity and the power to convene. And if you need any evidence of that, just look at our, our foes and our allies in the Middle East, how many trips they're making to Moscow as opposed to the United States. Not that Russia can fill that role, but in a vacuum, you know, nature abhors a vacuum, right? And I think the ability for the United States to put together the right coalitions in order to come up with the answer to the question I can't answer um, would, is something that in the past the United States has had at least a modicum of ability to do and does not have now. So I don't have a good answer for you. Can Russia do it? Highly unlikely in this charged environment where Russia and China probably have an incentive <clears throat> to work against US efforts on Iran and so forth. Uh, and the U.S. current, con in terms of the regional piece that you asked about, the ability for the regional actors, whether it's Iran's penetration of the civil war zones, which they use with their militias, to play a more constructive role, when in fact they're feeling like they're in a defensive crouch now, not just an offensive position, forward defense they call it, but an offensive crouch, I think it's highly unlikely they're going to play a constructive role. I do want to make a comment sort of somewhat tangentially germane to what was mentioned before and certainly germane to Stephen's comments earlier in this conversation. You know, in, in the chapter on geopolitics in this book, one of the things that came out of the Building for Peace project in my convers our conversations with Abdullah was that one of the problems in a country like Syria is that Syria was, prior to the Civil War, was already in a transitional moment, post-Soviet transitional moment. And it was incomplete. He said, I don't know if it would have succeeded, because that's a counterfactual, because the country went into civil war. But in reality, it, it came too soon, that we were in a transition. So my question, I guess, maybe a question for Stephen, or just a rhetorical question, is since there's no real muscle memory of any kind of, take, I know we don't want to reconstitute the state, and I know we're not trying to reconstitute the status quo ante, but the degree to which there was any real muscle memory, intellectual capital, in terms of understanding, even assuming you have the legitimacy of the state, which you don't, the lack of, 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 of intellectual capacity uh, in a society that had been characterized by crony capitalism and was already in the middle, had been in the middle of a transition away from a sprawling state sector, Soviet style, to a market sector approach, um, imperfect and, and, and incomplete, but since it was disrupted, what do you even have to go back to in terms of social capital or intellectual, I'm sorry, intellectual capital mm -hmm. is more of a question than, a, than an answer, but that's. Okay, let me throw as a last question. Sure. That, if you want to comment on, Steve. Uh, uh, if not, I have a final question from the audience that I'd like to throw to Steve and to Francesca. A uh, rather practical question that given that the overall conflicts are not ending right away, yeah. Uh, there are areas in these countries where there isn't conflict or isn't much conflict uh, and are not under what well, in Syria, not central government. And, you know, the question from the from the audience, are there uh, obviously parts of Syria, parts of Yemen, parts of Libya where reconstruction can begin? Uh, has it begun? If so, how do you do it if you do not have yet a national settlement? Uh, maybe Steve yeah. first and we end with. The World Bank. Take it from there. You know, I think one of the one of the biggest concerns about initiating reconstruction activity in Syria, as opposed to stabilization work, or as opposed to some of the the um, efforts intended just to restore basic infrastructure to a functioning level, concerns uncertainty of, uh, about the future. And you look at the Northeast, for example, where there are areas that um, have thus far at least remained largely, uh, largely peaceful. Um, you have very few of those areas increasingly in the Northwest. Even in the South, where the regime uh, reasserted its control some time ago, we're seeing increasing levels of instability and violence. And so I think we do find uh, enormous hesitation about embarking on reconstruction efforts that involve not just um, reconnecting the, you know, the, the, the Euphrates Dam to, uh, to the power grid in Syria, which is happening, things like that, but, but go beyond uh, infrastructure to these larger questions of governance and to, um, to strategies for rebuilding frameworks of, of economic governance, of, 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 of political governance, and, and until, it seems to me that until the political fate of those territories is a little more clear, 
um, it, it, reconstruction is likely to continue you can't to, do to be on hold. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think some of the justifications for that are very clear. Lots of areas that were outside of the Assad regime's control for an extended period of time succeeded in building fairly robust local governance structures. Those were all dismantled and the participants in them subject to regime detention and abuse uh, as soon as they were taken over again by the government. And so the track record in Syria is that areas where some possibility existed for building alternative frameworks of governance that might have supported reconstruction, um, were um, that those opportunities were foreclosed as soon as the regime re-entered. So with the offensive underway in Idlib, with Turkey and others challenging the future of the Northeast, I, I, I have to say, I think conditions are very unlikely to produce an interest in reconstruction work now. Okay. Uh, we're basically out of time, Francesca, but uh, your final comment? Final, final comment, uh, thoughts. Um, let me share with you the work that we've been doing in Libya. Since 2013, I've been involved working in Libya. And I would not call it by any stretch of imagination, reconstruction. Between 2013, 2014, we could talk about supporting, then we had the crisis 2014. But the work that we've been doing and the approach that we had had been a little bit at the local level, like Luigi was mentioning, and this tried to answer also Rossi, your question, but it has been what I will characterize as preparatory work. To build, and this I was thinking about Libya when you mentioned instead about Syria. Um, to really prepare for when we are gonna be able to have a different type of dialogue by building capacity of the technical staff in different part in local government, part of the central government, so that there is capacity for them to then make a decision about what is the vision they want to embrace, what is the state that they would like to develop, what is the path that they want to choose. So a lot of our work in this environment where we have an inability to really talk about the broad issue um, is really to focus on capacity. Capacity and going beyond just the humanitarian. We, we have done work on humanitarian mm -hmm. angle in Yemen, uh, but we're really thinking about capacity and human capacity. So to have the skill to then to be able to operate both at the local level and at the national level to think about the issue that needs to be addressed and that at this point we cannot address. And this is what we've been doing mm. for the past six Thank years. you, Francesca. Well, I uh, thank you all for being with us today. I encourage you to read these three publications, Fractured Stability from the European University Institute, the report that will be out next uh, month called uh, Building for Peace from the World Bank, and MEI's own uh, book, Escaping the Conflict Trap uh, Towards Ending Civil Wars in the Middle East. Which is available outside, I believe. Which is available outside. Thank you for participating in the uh, conversation through, uh, through this technology. I wasn't able to get to all of your questions, but we certainly got some. Please join me in thanking our panel for their work and for being with us today. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.